Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here today to talk a little bit about uh, the non-aggression axiom. In other words, to talk a little bit about what it's like to be a born-again Christian of the libertarian strain, okay? So whether libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, minimalist, whatever you want to call it, or what, you know, I shouldn't say whatever you want to call it. There are differences between these two, or these few different ideas. I wanted to start out uh, with the Bible. I think the Bible's important, uh, obviously very important. And uh, how do we practice this non-aggression axiom um, in what we would call maybe an anarcho-capitalistic world, where the government is not there to take care of all these things that we think are essential for the government to take care of? Well, the first thing people are going to go after is they're going to go after Romans chapter 13. All right, There's a Peter passage as well, but I think Romans 13 makes the point very well about obeying the powers that be. And this will be thrown at you quite often if you come from more of an anarcho position. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do you what is good? Do you want to have praise from the same? For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and adventure to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, she must, therefore you must be subject not only because of the wrath, but for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. There are so many ways of working through this text and pointing out different issues just to think about. All right? Now, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those resist will bring judgment on themselves. Now, that is earthly judgment. So it doesn't exactly say that God is going to judge you, but we're not saying that's not the case either, but it's just a fault. All right? And also, I think it's verse 7. Let's see here. Render therefore all their due. There's another argument again. So this is where conscience comes in. What's due? Is it okay for the federal government to take, let the Federal Reserve print money and then pay them interest on it and fight wars we don't approve of? Is that legal? Well, not in keeping with the Constitution within the founding documents. Okay? So there's at least some room here, looking at this passage, to think also to the first century. Herod, well, he was a jerk, but he was, a, he was the leader back then. Also, don't forget, the apostles went to jail for breaking those very laws that they're told to abide by. They were very many of them killed for preaching the gospel. So they broke the law. So it must have been okay. So there's a point where we can break the law. Where is that point? Well, without going into detail, which we don't really need to go into detail on this, I can just point out some things that I kind of know are true. Number one, you do not have to be a cheerleader for statism. Okay, so let's say that you owe some taxes. Now, I'm going to argue that most of the taxes that you pay are probably not moral. They're probably not even owed to the government. They're probably not even, they're, they're probably just immoral taxes. But pay them. You don't want to go to jail. There's no point in that. However, you don't have to say it's okay because it's still not against the law to say it's not okay. It's not against the law to say we shouldn't be sending troops overseas to fight wars that are not declared. It's okay. We can legally say that. All right? They're going to try to stop you from saying it. And they might even use the illegally passed espionage acts, pull the same stunts that Adams pulled, President Adams, who was a horrible president, regardless of him being in the founding father generation, or Woodrow Wilson throwing Eugene Debs in jail, though Debs was a socialist. I don't approve of that. He got a lot of votes for president in jail. Okay? So... We don't have to be a cheerleader for the state. Just a thought. So go ahead, follow the rules. So you determine where you're going to break the law. I mean, you might be told you can't preach the gospel anymore. Well, you have to decide. Should I preach the gospel? Should I break the law? Uh, and, and also, you need to respect people's freedom of conscience. And this is what's cool. If a fellow Christian has been charged with not paying his taxes... 
to let's say the city of whatever, Dallas, because he finds out that some of his property taxes are going to support an abortion clinic. You're a Christian. He's a Christian. He has a freedom of conscience. It doesn't matter what the law says. Common law, jurors could always negate the law. You can say that law is wrong. I don't even care. It's not applied properly. You can literally. O.J. Simpson's jury did it legally. They acquitted him. They could do that, even though we know he did it. You can say, in this case, I don't agree with it. Because if you can't do that, then we have a trial by government, not a trial by jury. Then the only option when you have trials by government, once the ballot box has been expended, is the ammo box. And I'm very peaceful. I'm a pacifist, except for when it comes to defending your, your, your life. So I would really say that we need to not promote that. But the reality is you can acquit. That's the thing. If somebody's child is being taken from him and he believes it's wrong because the, the social workers are sexually immoral and they're going to take his child, he has a right to defend himself with force if he chooses. So I can acquit him for using force against an officer of the state. I can acquit him. But am I saying I'm going to do it? No, maybe my conscience says I should abide by Romans 13, which that is God's word, and not do that. I can acquit. So there's some things you can do. And also just realize, you know, how important non-aggression is. Not aggressing against people. Not hurting people. Not shooting bullets at different countries. Back in the 90s, people think that the Iraqi war, the first Iraqi war just kind of ended with Daddy Bush and then under Clinton. If you'll excuse that noise, I had to run my AC. Under Daddy Bush, thing, or under Clinton, things got better. Oh no, they were bombing and bombing and bombing, and they were embargoing and starving children. Madeleine Albright was once asked, "Was a half was were a half a million Iraqi children's deaths worth it?" And she said, "Yes." That is sick. You don't have to cheerlead that because the USA did it. You don't have to cheerlead hundreds of thousands of Japanese being killed in the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You don't have to be a cheerleader. You don't have to be a cheerleader for the death of over a half a million, if not really even a million people dead over the most ridiculous, aggressive war ever, the war between the states. You do not have to approve of it. You don't have to hang Lincoln's picture on your wall. Now, you might decide you want to do that. That's fine. But we can support non-aggression, not aggressing against other people. I believe the Bible is clear when it says, Thou shalt not steal. Okay? In my mind... Medicaid is stealing. Section 8 is stealing. Now, others view that differently. And so I pay my taxes to cover those things. All right? But no self-righteous Christian is going to look at me and ever tell me, exegetically looking at the Bible, that he or she can argue that Jesus said it is okay to steal money from one group to give it to another group. That's something states do. Now, we see in Romans 13 what their job is to do, but we know they don't always do their job. Okay, We understand that very clearly. They don't always do their job. So we can feel that way. You may not feel that way. You may not think that if, I, if, if my property is absconded from me and I have to pay property tax to educate somebody else's kid or to put my kid in a school of the government's choice, you may think that's okay. I call that stealing. I don't care if you have $10 billion and the other guy is dying deadly, he's dying in a ditch. If the government steals one penny from you to give to that man starving in the ditch, that government is a, thief, is a thief. All that government is is an intermediary who took money from you to give to somebody else. That's theft. It may sound like the most horrible way of putting it, but in my mind that's theft. Now you may see that differently. I have a freedom of conscience, you see. All right? See, my freedom of conscience says I won't drink alcohol. I, I won't do drugs. I won't do cocaine. But my freedom of conscience says it is a sin to lock a man in a cage for snorting cocaine. And I can acquit him. Okay? That's where we're coming from, and that, that's what a lot of Christians haven't thought through. Okay? When a police officer who is living in sin with his girlfriend in sexual sin arbitrarily arrests somebody for the sexual sin of paying for a prostitute, he is a moral criminal, and his church should call him out for that if he's involved in a church. But even if he's living with his wife of 40 years and has never had sex out of wedlock, he's still wrong. 
to take my money from me to build a cage to put that person in for his sin. We need to learn not to aggress against people. That's why so many conservatives are looked at badly now because for years conservatives have thought it's okay to build a cage to lock somebody in that cage for committing certain sins that are not aggressive against other people. All right? Now, if the man's having sex with a 12-year-old and he's 30, okay, there, there's a problem. That's aggression. All right? And different people will determine that different ways, but I would, I would argue that's aggressive. That's wrong. That's statutory rape, and I believe that is a, a, a valid law. Now, thou shalt not kill. Now, I say don't aggress against somebody's body. Now, the pro-life or the pro-abortion movement says don't aggress against my body. That's one of the most ignorant arguments I've ever heard because as soon as you go in and you remove that baby with that separate set of DNA, that, that, that baby with his own systems, whether he's viable or not, that's arbitrary. The moment you hurt that child, you are a murderer. Okay? So while I don't have the authority to put you in a cage for snorting heroin, if you want to snort it, <laughs> I don't have the authority to put you in jail for having any gun, whether it's automatic, semi-automatic at all. I have no authority to put you in a box or lock you up in a cage for protecting yourself that way. I do have the moral authority, the higher law, to stop you from murdering your baby. That's wrong because that's God's image-bearing child. Now, here is how we should live if we're anarcho-capitalists. And I believe it was one of the best ways it could have ever been put, the way Jesus put it. In Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 25, there's a passage in here where he quotes from the Pentateuch, interesting passage, and a lot of folks don't realize what this passage connects into. All right? And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. That's a great passage. Love your neighbor. Love God. The basic law. Okay? All wrapped up in that. But a lot of people don't realize that one of the greatest stories in the Bible, one of the most memorable stories in the Bible, one of the most memorable parables, is the example that Jesus directly gave this lawyer to explain that. Because that lawyer said, and he wanting to justify himself, okay, wanted to be righteous before himself, said to him, who is my neighbor? And guess what story Jesus told? He told the story of the Good Samaritan. He takes a man who is despised by Israel, a Samaritan, what they call a half-breed, and says, guess what? This is a very modern... I mean, I could read the passage, but I mean, and I hope you know the story. But there's a dude on the side of the road. He's been beat up and left for dead by bandits. And this Samaritan, this half-breed, comes by and takes care of him. Binds up his wounds. Puts him in a, in a basically a Motel 6. And when I preach God's Word, I do read the Scripture in more detail. I'm not trying to be Stephen Furtick here and be, you know, cool and hip. He told the guy that, this is how a modern guy would do it. The modern person goes down to the Motel 6 and says, Hey man, this guy's in really, really bad shape. He has a hard time getting around. How much is your room per night? 60 bucks? I won't be back for two weeks. You seem like a trustworthy guy. So $60 for two weeks. Can you give me a bargain maybe? The guy says, yeah, I'll give you. I'll cut you a break. I'll let him have the room for $500 plus tax. Let's say that's $600. The guy says, right here, man. Put $600 on my Visa card. Ching. All right. Here's another $500. There's a, there's a guy down the road. He's a doctor. He's a friend of mine. He'll come in and look, look after him for not very much money. But you keep up with it, all right? Here's my doctor friend's name, John Smith. Here's his phone number. Here's his email. Once that money runs low or if I'm not here in two weeks... You've got my Discover card number, charge on, or my Visa card number. That's what this guy did. And we are called to help and called to assist other people. So whether we agree that it's okay to take money from somebody else to pay for Medicaid or not, God calls us to help other people. And I won't even go into the fact that 
if the government wasn't doing 90% of what it's, what it's doing, which is wrong anyway, we'd be a whole lot better off. If we required a declaration of war to shoot one bullet, that'd be nice, man. One bullet gets shot. One troop gets sent somewhere, declare war. They won't do that. Okay? If the Federal Reserve could not just print money and the government had to tax you for all these wars, it'd be awesome. But you know what? No, regardless of how wicked the system is, and we can secede from whatever parts we want to secede from. You can secede from vaccinations. You can secede from the medical industry except for emergency care. You can secede from the education system. You can secede from the media. You can secede from the cities where everybody's moving to. You can secede from that. But you're still going to be stuck. You're on the hook. The criminal's going to get you. You're going to pay some taxes. You're going to, you're going to be forced to support things you don't want to support. But you're still called to help other people who are in need. So when someone looks at you and says, look, you're just no good, you have no compassion, you don't believe everybody has a right to education. If that person doesn't believe a person has a right to exit his mother's womb without being poisoned, that's not even worth answering, okay? They have nothing to back themselves up with, and they very seldom read their Bibles. If you believe it or not, this is how ignorant people are on the streets about the Bible who try to use the Bible. There was a lady who got one of uh, InfoWars guys, Owen Schroyer, going, about abortion. God bless Owen. God bless InfoWars. They are, they are very pro-life. Well, he was trying to defend human life. This lady mentioned Numbers chapter 5 in saying that starting in verse 11, the priests are told how to do abortions. That is so not true. That is such a perversion of that passage. Owen didn't know the scripture very well. Owen said something about New Testament versus Old Testament, this, that, and the other. He didn't really have a theological response. But there's a strong theological response. Read about that law concerning unfaithful wives. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with going in and removing a baby and killing it. Just read that scripture. All right. Well, God bless you all and realize that you can be a good Christian without being a socialist, a neocon, a conservative, that you can believe in non-aggression against anyone, including the unborn, and be a perfectly fine Christian, but follow Christ. Because people can abuse your rights all they want, but if you're not sold out to Jesus Christ and serving Him and understanding you are a sinner lost in need of Him, all of this political stuff is going to do you no good. God bless.